Well, hi, everybody. Um, hope you can hear me OK. Uh, welcome to another Manfrotto School of Excellence webinar. Today, we've got Victoria Hillman presenting uh, Nature's Beauty Through My Lens. Um, the, the talk will be split into roughly into about five sections. So, you know, please send in your questions as normal if you've, if you've participated before in the webinars. And uh, we'll, we'll do the best to answer the questions. Uh, with you today is myself, Kevin Price. Uh, Manfrotto, European Web Marketing Manager, and William Bacassi is a coordinator for the School of Excellence in Italy. Um, Manfrotto School of Excellence is uh, an online imaging education resource that's brought to you by some of the best professionals of the imaging world, including Bill Frakes, Joe McNally, Steve Gosling, Victoria, of course, uh, Jacob James, and many others. Um, the school is supported by some of the best accessory brands in the market, including Manfrotto, Gitzo, Kata, National Geographic Bags, Lastolite, and Avenger. Um, as you can see from this slide, if you look at the bottom, um, just simply write your questions uh, to Victoria in the, in the bottom where it says enter a question for the staff. And um, I'll, I'll pick out some of the best ones, uh, and at the right moment, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get the, the answers for you. A little bit about uh, Victoria. She's an award-winning wildlife and nature photographer. She recently won two top awards at the Zoological Society of London Animal Photography Prize Awards, and her winning, winning images were on exhibition at the London Zoo. I think it was until the end of last year, and she was, in fact, she was the only female adult winner to win such a prize. Favorite camera and lens: Canon 7D, Canon 100mm lent macro lens. Favorite tripod kit is a Manfrotto 390 series tripod. For more information on everything that uh, Victoria is up to, uh, you can go to website vicfixpix.com. And uh, Victoria tells us she particularly likes or finds the Cata Elements cover invaluable. She takes it everywhere, as, as, uh, and it will deal with whatever the weather throws at, at her, which is crucial for her photography, because she's always at work in the field. If you want to find out more about uh, the Elements cover, Cata Elements cover, or Cata bags in general, uh, just go to catabags.co.uk. Okay, at this point, um, that's enough from me. I'll, I'll pass you over to Victoria for the uh, the rest of the presentation, which I hope you enjoy. Okay, Victoria, I can see your um, first slide now. Yep, all up and running. All looking good. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my second webinar for the Manfrotto School of Excellence. I'm actually going to take you through some of my favorite images um, during the next 45 minutes or so, but I have split them into three different, sorry, five different areas. And what we're actually going to start with is never missing an opportunity. Now, this might sound a bit crazy, but sometimes the weather can throw interesting things at you or even you might find an animal that you weren't expecting. It's always best to make, make the best of all these opportunities when they arise. So we're actually going to start off with a couple of images. They're not of wildlife. They are actually of landscapes. And it's actually the effects of frozen fog. Now, in all the years that I've been working as a photographer, I've never seen frozen fog have this effect on the countryside. All of the white that you can see in this image is, in fact, ice crystals on pretty much everything. Now, on all of my images as we go through, just a few bits about them, all of them have been done in camera, so there is no post-processing work that goes on on any of my images. And you can actually see all the technical details on every single image as well. So the camera, the lens, um, the ISO, the aperture, and also the shutter speed. So this image is actually, it, it's an image of the whole area of the countryside covered in, in the ice crystals. Let me get in a little bit closer. And these crystals that you can see now are purely down to frozen fog, but it was 48 hours of frozen fog. Now, I've never seen anything like this, so I wanted to just get out there and make the most of these crystals. Now, about 24 hours after I took these, everything was gone, and it was all back to being browns and greens and very wet. 
So we're going to move on to something slightly warmer and away from the ice crystals. And sunbeams. Now, this was an incredible opportunity that I had. I was in the Romanian Carpathians, and I'd been out there for about two weeks. And I've been assured that during June, it doesn't rain in Romania. The first week we were out there, it did nothing but rain. But then eventually, we got up bright and early before the sunrise and walked up into the forest. It was due to be a very nice day. Thankfully, the rain had all rained itself out. And as we got up into the forest, the sun started to rise. But as, that it, but as it did, it started to cause all the water from the forest to actually evaporate, really accentuating the sunbeams that you can see coming through uh, the trees here. Now, this is what I mean by never miss an opportunity. <clears throat> this is a probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get such clear sunbeams coming through the forest. If it's there, whether it's something you don't expect or, you know, you may just come across a particular animal that you'll see in the next slide that you're not expecting to see, just take some photos of it because you never know. You may actually get something that you fall in love with. So we're going to move back to my favorite subject now, which is wildlife. Now, the snake that you can see here is actually a Madagascan tree boa. Now, we hadn't gone out looking for tree boas. We'd actually gone out looking for nighttime animals such as mouse lemurs and chameleons. And it just so happened, as we were driving along the road, our driver stopped suddenly um, and explained that there was a snake in the road. There's only one thing to do, really. I jumped out of the, the minibus and got down onto the floor and started taking photos. And you can actually see just how close I was to the snake when I was photographing it. Now, it's actually really important to know the animal that you're photographing as well, because with this one, it was actually raining. It was a pretty wet, damp, and cold night, so I knew that not only was the snake not going to be moving very fast, but also, with it being a Madagascan tree boa, the chance of it actually attacking were very slim. So what I would just say, just quickly before we move on to the next section, is that if you do come across something, Always make sure you take your camera with you and just snap away. Now, do we have any questions before we move on? Yeah, just a couple of questions from that, that section. And uh, it's um, <coughs> basically, uh, Elena saying she had a similar opportunity. She, she took the photo, but it was just this point you see colored discs, you know, the sun, sun reflections in the lens. She had the lens shade on. Is there something she could have done to, uh, to make that a better shot? I've actually had the same problem. Um, to be honest, it's it's moving around, seeing if in, if you're in one location, just move slightly to one side or point your camera slightly so it's not directly at the sun, and that might actually help alleviate some of those problems. Um, just, just slightly, not quite related to that session, but how do you suggest getting clear in focus photos when using a close-up of a, say, a wildflower? Uh, that's from Paul. On it. Um, in terms of getting everything in focus. Yeah, I think yeah, basically just getting. I think the emphasis is more on you know making making the the the, white, the flower in focus. Yeah, a close up. Yeah. Um, make sure you have your focus point on the main area that you want to be in focus. With all certainly with all digital SLRs, you do have um, a number of focus points that you can use and you can select them for being um, for all over the screen really and if you want to bring the whole flower into focus I would just um, basically up your F number um, so uh, decrease the size of your aperture which will increase the depth of field Great stuff, uh, last, last question from Paul Chambers is what's the best focal length on macro? Um, I tend to use my 100mm macro lens um, it, it's pretty much the only lens I tend to use for macro, um, although I do have some extension tubes if I'm working with very small animals, which just helps. It basically tricks your camera into thinking you're um, further away than you actually are. Good stuff. Um, uh, okay, I'll leave you to get to go through the next section, which is using starburst filters to, to enhance, you know, creatively your photographs, yeah? Yeah. Good stuff. So this may surprise some of you with this one that I actually use a starburst filter. Now, 
I actually bought my Starburst filter for something specific. Unfortunately, true, true to form with the great, great British weather, I've not managed to actually get out and use it for what I wanted it for, but I have been um, testing it out and getting used to it. Now, like me, you've probably seen many different photographs of Starburst filters used with water to produce basically a lot of sparkle. But what I want them for is to produce one or maybe just a couple of specific starbursts. And I'm actually just going to take you through a few images now of different ways to use it. And that you can actually use it in black and white to create a very striking image as well. Now, there are several types of starburst filters you can get, the most common being the six, the four, the six, or the eight point. Personally, I prefer to use the six point um, starburst filter as it just creates a slightly more natural look. So we'll start off with some leaves. This is actually taken in autumn and very misty morning with dew on pretty much everything. And the starburst that you can actually see coming through the leaves is actually the sun. Now this was the first time I'd actually ever used a starburst filter. I had no idea what to do with it. I just started taking some pictures and hoped that they would come out okay. And I actually learned as I went along that you need to be more or less looking directly into the sun to get a really good starburst. Now on this particular image, it's not just one starburst, there are several. You have got a couple in the water droplets just to the bottom and if you go straight up there's actually another one um, just up at the top. Now with the starburst filters, I actually, I now use it to create one or two little starbursts and the beauty about this is with the starburst filter on the end of your lens, you can move around and get yourself into a position to pick up as many or as few starbursts as you want so you can see the effects straight away. So we're going to move on to quite a This is a very strong one. It's just the one coming directly through the trees and it's uh, several people have actually said that it's it's the best starburst they've ever seen. Um, I don't know if it is or not, but it creates a very striking image and actually helps to pick up all the autumn um, golds and reds in the leaves as well. Now, in a very similar position, I, I actually tried this out in black and white as well, and you get a slightly different effect, but it does work in black and white. So don't be don't be scared or um, or worried about using it in black and white. What I would say is give it a go. And whenever I get be it a, a camera, a lens, or even just a filter, I will actually go to town on using it, trying it in pretty much every situation that I can to try to get the best out of that piece of equipment and getting to know it so that when the time comes that I definitely need to get the odd starburst here and there, I can put it on, I know what I need to do, and I can just do it. Now next up, we've got some photos of flowers. They are actually snowdrops. And the first one, I actually just wanted to pick out two starbursts. So you've got one, the main one is actually in the water droplet on the stem, and there is actually another one just at the top in the green part of the flower. Now with so with the starburst filter, you can actually move around, and as you move around, you will see the effects immediately through the viewfinder. So you, you can take the picture and then look at the picture as well, but you will also see as you move yourself where the starburst moved to, and you can decide how many or how few you actually want. So I'm actually going to bring up an example of one where I've deliberately got too many starbursts in there, and one where I personally think it's just enough, just so that you can see the difference. So as you look at the screen, the ones on the left hand side for me has way too many starbursts in them. You can see the lines going pretty much straight across the picture. And then the one on the right, it's just got much smaller ones, they're not as big, the points aren't anywhere near as long. Now there are a couple of ways you can do this. This image is actually more or less taken in the same position, but by slightly underexposing it, you can actually dramatically decrease the length of the points that come out from the starbursts. 
<clears throat> now on this particular image, I've actually used a water spray as well, which I will do occasionally, only when plants are involved. I won't use a water spray when there's animals, it's only plants. And these particular plants are actually um, in a family garden. But it's, it's getting to know it and knowing what you can do with that particular piece of equipment. So by picking out just one or two smaller starbursts, for me, it really enhances the image. But you do have to take pretty much directly in the sun to actually bring the starbursts out. If you photograph from the side, you will actually find that you won't pick up um, any starbursts at all. So that's, that's it for how to use a starburst creatively. Uh, what I will say is when I first got it, um, a lot of people said to me, why have you bought one of those? And it was really frowned upon that I'd actually go as far as using a starburst. I'm very aware of the fact that you can add starbursts in uh, photo editing software, but everything that I do, I like to do in camera in the field. And hopefully later on in the year, I'll actually be using a similar technique to pick out um, bits of light on the water droplets when I go out to photograph insects. So just um, yeah, just one question uh, from that part of the talk. Uh, I think you just answered it, to be honest. It's from, from Jerry Walden. He says, but all the images you created are in camera. So you, are you shooting RAW or JPEGs? I always shoot in RAW. No. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, the, the difference with RAW and JPEG is that if you shoot in RAW, it will save all of the information. If you shoot in JPEG, it will only uh, save part of the information of that particular image. Sure. So, uh, for example, if you shoot an image in black and white uh -huh. in RAW, if you do want to then convert it to color later, you can. If you shoot an image in black and white as a JPEG, you can't then add the color to it afterwards because it's only saved the information as a black and white image, not as a color image. Okay, great. Um, another question from Daryl Black. He says, um, are most of the macro shots you've taken using a tripod or, or, or most of them handheld? They come, just the camera? Uh, the majority of them are actually handheld. Okay. Um, especially with the snowdrops, I have to get very, very low to the ground. So what I tend to use is uh, just a, an old jumper rolled up and lean the camera on the jumper. Yeah, I must say it's a beautiful image, image of the uh, of that one there. Um, okay, and that that's all the questions for that section. So um, moving on, I think we're going on to just you say it's concentrating on just one subject at a time and go, and go to town on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this next section is really about picking one subject. Um, spending a lot of time with that subject and really going to town on it, exploring different possibilities, different angles, black and white, color, sepia, just basically exploring a lot of different areas of one particular subject. The more time you spend with one subject, the better the results will actually be as a result of it. If you go out and say you just try to photograph everything that you see, you may come back with one or two good images. Whereas if you go out and say, right, today I'm just going to go out and photograph, for example, um, damselflies, then you spend your time and you concentrate on that particular species. And you'll come back and you'll have, some, you'll have a far better variety of images than if you um, try to photograph everything at once. Now, the only exception to this is actually if you're doing um, ID or documentary photography when you actually want to try to photograph pretty much as much as you can in quite a short space of time. But what we're going to concentrate on here, we're going to start with foxes, move back to our snowdrops, go on to seals, and then something a little bit different. Now, I love foxes, and they have a lot of character. Now, this particular fox, she is actually a rescue fox. She was rescued as a cub. She's currently being rehabilitated and hopefully will be released back into the wild should we ever get a spring. And I was lucky enough to spend a couple of hours with her and just exploring all different angles, different colors. So this first one that you can see is actually in sepia. 
Now I have actually overexposed this image because I wanted the overall fox and grass to blend together so that you could really see the concentration in her face and all the colouring around her, her eyes, her nose and her ears. We have two different angles. So we've got a close-up with, um, with her on the left-hand side and the one on the right-hand side is actually her brother who is also being re rehabilitated but from a distance. So we'll start with the one on the left. Now, foxes are quite curious animals, especially when they're young. And as you'll see a bit later, she got an awful lot closer than she is in this image at the moment. But I got right down to her level. So instead of standing up and shooting down on her, I actually got right down to shoot at her eye level, which gives a much better connection with the animal. Whereas the one on the right-hand side, where he's sitting up, in the top left hand corner, I actually wanted to just take a step back a little bit. So this is actually taken standing up, but standing from quite a way back and having him just positioned right up there in the top left hand corner looking down as if he's looking over his territory. And we're going back to our sepia here. Increasingly I am using um, monochrome for my wildlife photography simply because when you take the colour out of an image, you suddenly know, start to notice all the details, all the markings in her ears, her nose, her eyes, for example. And I've used quite a high contrast in this one just to really bring out those eyes, which are the main focal point of the image. Now, next up, we have another image of her, but she got a bit closer this time. And this actually remains one of my favourite images to date. Now, when I took this image, and if you look really closely, you can actually see the reflection of me photographing her in her eyes. Her paws were actually on my leg. She was looking straight up at me. Now, I've left this one in colour because just the different shades of oranges and reds and browns in her face were incredible. And it's just a really nice close-up image um, of a fox that you don't, you don't tend to see. But I've shown you five very different images of foxes there, which shows that even just by spending a couple of hours with one particular animal, it just gives you that time to get to know the animal and then work out different ways you can try to bring out their personality. Now we are going to move away from wildlife just for a second and move on to flowers. I've actually spent about four or five days photographing snowdrops in varying lighting conditions and varying weather conditions, but everything you see in the next few images, it is all natural lighting. Now they vary from this particular image, you've got just a very small amount of snowdrop actually highlighted. It is horrendously underexposed with high contrast level. So I just wanted to create quite a dramatic image before the snowdrop even opened, so it was just that beautiful little teardrop shape. Then as we go on through the day, it warms up and the beautiful thing about springtime is that you do get some lovely lighting and snowdrops generally will tend to grow in areas that do have at least some dappled lighting coming through the trees. So the one on the left, um, it actually has a starburst filter on it but I've chosen not to have any starbursts on the actual image itself out. But what it has done is helped to create um, a bit of a bokka effect in the background, so giving a much softer um, view to the image. Now the one on the right, it is actually a bit of a lucky shot this one. I wanted to get a really beautiful shot of a snowdrop open with the green heart shape on it, the inverted heart shape. But while I was photographing this particular flower, I actually noticed that this tiny little money spider had actually crawled up to the top. So I started to concentrate on the money spider and the main focal point on this image is actually on the spider. It's not on the flower itself. Because I wanted that to be the main, the main point that you looked at. And it actually just shows a relationship between the spider and the flower. 
Now next up we have something a little bit more artistic. I really did go to town on these snowdrops. I probably could have given an entire 45 minute webinar on all the images that I actually took of the snowdrops. And um, to just four. But this is one of my more artistic ones. This is taken using completely natural light, a high contrast level with darkened shadows. And then it's underexposed to black out the background. Now there's no filters on this at all. It is just a straightforward macro lens. And with the water droplets on. And again, I've actually used a water spray just to add those those little droplets on, just for a little bit more texture on the actual flower itself. So we are going to move away from flowers now and move on to something a little bit more or a little bigger, onto seals. Once a, once a year I will try to go and photograph seals either in Norfolk or in Lincolnshire. So this first one's actually taken at Blakely Point. And I actually go during November, which is the breeding season for the seals. So the mums come on shore to pup and the males will fight it out as to who gets to mate with all the females that have just pupped. It's an incredible experience to be there during this time and it really is a case of just knowing these seals really well. I'll tend to pick one position and stay there all day because by not moving around the seals become used to my presence there as long as I make no sudden movements. They just don't seem to be that bothered. They know I'm there but they also know that I'm not going to cause them any harm or disturbance. And they just go about their natural routine. So here we actually have two males just sizing each other up um, on one of the sandbanks. And in the background, that's actually a female who's just come ashore to start pupping. <clears throat> now, spending time with seals does mean you get to have some intimate moments. This is a little seal pup with its big dark eyes and its very muddy looking face. By actually spending four or five days at a time with the seals, you get to see every part of the life cycle. So I've actually seen seals being born moments after they've been born right the way through to them being ready to head into the sea. Now the seal pups themselves are probably one of the cutest babies in the world. But that's not an image that's actually that easy to try and capture. And this one was actually just looking straight at me and I just felt completely lost in this little pup's eyes. Now, a slightly different take on the seal pup. And there's actually a seal pup on the beach. So not more than a few days old. But it actually shows the little seal, seal pup on the wide expanse of beach. Now, for this one, I've actually used a tripod. It was actually a very windy day. So to provide myself with more stability, everything was mounted on the tripod, um, complete with elements covers to protect my camera from the sand. But it is really important, if you are going to go to town on a subject, try to capture the close-ups, but also take a step back and really show the animal in its environment as well. So just going to give you a bit more comical image. I found this seal completely relaxed and chilled out on the beach. And it's one of those funny moments that, that you, uh, if you see, you do just have to capture them. They don't come along very often. It's a very brutal time of year for the seals. There's a lot of fighting going on. Um, and this was just a moment of, of calm and relaxation and, I don't know, maybe a happy dream about fish for this particular seal. So this is what I mean by going to town on one subject. So we're just going to move away from seals onto whirlpools, which may surprise you. These next two photographs are actually taken in Scotland. Now, I was lucky enough to be working as a wildlife guide up on the boats up in Scotland for eight months. Every time I went out into the Corrie Vrecken, I took my camera and I just photographed away. I just took shots of every single whirlpool. And I've actually probably only come away with... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> two or three really good images of whirlpools. 
to this first one as she shows the whirlpool <coughs> in the context of the islands behind. And that island behind is actually the Isle of Jura. And then next up we have it in black and white. Now this is one time where using black and white can really help to add more moodiness to your image. And as you can see from the technical details, this is actually taken with a compact camera. It's not taken with a digital camera at all. <coughs> so it doesn't matter if you're out and about. You don't need to take a digital, um, a digital SLR with you. You can actually take a compact camera and still capture some really good moments. The importance is to actually have something with you all the time. Now these images are actually taken over over the space of about eight months, so it really was a case of snapping at every opportunity that I had, and it was only because I spent so much time in that particular body of water that I was able to capture the images. <coughs> some, some fantastic images there, and, and thanks uh, thanks for uh, sort of keeping going. I know uh, Victor was uh, battling a little bit of a a cold because of the uh, uh, she's probably out in the uh, the elements a little bit more than certainly me anyway and uh, <laughs> but, uh, just just dealing with it very well and uh, some some extraordinary images of whirlpools there and the, and the seals um, we've we've got some some nice questions from from the audience here we've got uh, Alba says as wild animals don't like to approach very close to us do you use a multiplier on your 100 mil macro lens um, I actually don't know. Um, what I tend to do is I will actually go and find a place, certainly with the seals, most of my seal shots are actually taken, the close-ups are actually taken on 100 to 400 um, zoom lens at 400 mil. Um, but what I'll tend to do is go and find myself a position that is a safe distance from any wildlife that is around and I will just sit there. And what I found is that by sitting there over time, um, animals just, they just seem to relax and then go about their natural, their natural routine to the point that a couple of years ago when I went up to Blakeney Point, I actually, I was just sat there just snapping away and I hadn't noticed that the seal pup had actually come almost right up to my feet and that was just the inquisitive nature of the wildlife itself. I mean, obviously, I, they, they felt that I wasn't going to pose a threat to them. The important thing is that if that happens, that you just don't make any sudden movements at all, um, because the last thing you want to do is actually spook them. Sure, and I think Richard's question, Richard Love's <coughs> question is related to that. He says, when you photograph the seals, were you in a protective area? I think you've you've already indicated that you were you're out in the open, weren't you? I am completely out in the open. Um, that way, there are no surprises to the seals. But also, I I will just sit there. And I, I can sit in the same place for three, four, five hours at a time. And I just, I won't cause any, I won't do any sudden movements or any noises. I think it goes without saying that my phone is actually always switched off when I'm out and about with the wildlife. But most of, when I'm photographing, um, certainly with the seals, as I said, it's, most of it is at 400 mil on my zoom lens. And, and, and uh, Paul, Paul uh, Chambers asked another, asking another question. Uh, how do you get high contrast in, in, in camera? Um, you've actually got, in your camera settings, there is actually, as you go through and you pick, say, your your standard setting, if it's on Canon, you've got standard portrait landscape. If you go into those individual settings, you've actually got contrast there, and you can set the contrast higher or lower depending on what, what you actually want. Okay. Final, final question from John Cannon. He says he's, he's going. He's off to Churchill, Man Manitoba, for polar bear photography. Um, and he's, uh, he's 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 asking which uh, which lens would you recommend? I think you've maybe said that already in, in the previous answer. Um, but, yeah. It, I would actually take a, a couple if your weight limit allows you. Um, because I have heard that if you're in one of the, the trucks that goes out on the ice, the bears can actually be incredibly close. I mean, obviously, if you're using a zoom lens, you do have a minimal focusing distance. So I actually tend to take an 18 to 270 and then a 
a bigger zoom lens, like a 100 to 400. So I basically all my bases are covered between those two lenses. Okay, that sounds that sounds very good. Um, I'll, I'll I'll leave you to go through the next section of the talk uh, using natural light. Okay, so next section has about five images on it, and it is all about using the natural light. So these next five images, I've used no flash at all. It is just purely the natural light that was there when I took the images. We're going to start off with a puffin. Now, normally when we see puffin photographs, they're actually on land. They're in their full breeding colors. This was right towards the end of the breeding season. The puffins were all heading back out to sea. And it's at this point the puffins actually lose that really brightly colored bill that they're famed for. Now, this image is actually taken from a moving boat, or well, at this point we were stationary, but it is actually taken from a boat out in the open ocean. And the one thing I really liked was the soft lighting just created these beautiful textures on a really calm sea with the little puff in there just swimming into the frame. But it's, it's the natural light that's really created this image. If I try to bring out the colors in the puffin um, or uh, flashes just to, to highlight the image even more, I think it just wouldn't create the same kind of image. Next up we have a spider. I do apologize for anyone out there if you don't like spiders. It is the only spider that's going to appear in this presentation. And this is actually a long-jawed orbweb spider. Now, this is lit completely by sunlight, uh, believe it or not. Now, I've actually gone for black and white because I wanted to create a much more striking image, but also a bit more of a creepy image um, with this particular spider. Now, it's busy cleaning its front legs. This is actually a male spider, and it's taken during the autumn. Now, during the autumn time, um, down on the sunset levels, if you do get a sunny day, when the sun comes out, it actually it is surprisingly strong, and it shines through these spiders, um, really highlighting their legs. And again, I've used high contrast level, but I have underexposed it to just bring out the tiny hairs on one of its front legs and the light shining through the rest of its body. <laughs> Slightly softer take on an image here. This is taken quite late on, um, just before sunset, and it's a very soft image. That pinky color is actually coming from the sunset. And for this one, I've actually used a very soft contrast as well. So I've taken the contrast right down and actually used a bit of a soft focus as well. And it's just that soft evening light that then has helped to create um, an almost misty appearance to the overall image. Look at that. Um, it's very, very specific lighting on this one. It was actually coming out of the shade, just coming through a patch of light. But the light he was coming through, it literally just picked out his face or the top of his head as he came through the water. And a lot of people have said to me, um, do not think about trying to balance the light out. To be honest, it is the light that makes this image. If you try to balance out light in an image like this, what will happen is you'll get a very, very flat image. Instead, you're really drawn to those eyes and the textures on its, on its head and straight down its back as well. And then last up for the using natural light section is a swan. This is taken in the middle of the day, around about lunchtime, using only natural light. But it's taken in winter time. Now, if I'm going to use light to create very high contrast images, I will actually always use winter light because it's very harsh. Summer lighting can be a lot softer. So with, with January lighting in particular, you get a nice, beautiful, bright, sunny day it actually makes your whites a lot whiter and your darks a lot darker. And that's exactly what's happened here. Yeah. Now, I've actually opted for black and white purely because swans lend themselves to black and white very well due to the, the whiteness of their feathers and then just the black around its face. And for this one, I actually got myself into a position such that half the face was in shadow, just picking out that one eye 
and the one bit just around the beak here, but still leaving all the textures in the feathers and then also the little bit of um, reflection in the water there. Some, some fantastic images there. Um, a question from Richard Lau. He said, uh, you, you say you use the Tamron 8, 18 to 270. Uh, do, is that to, because you're traveling, you need to travel light, or does it meet the, the quality standards that, you, that you're trying to get? Um, it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, certainly, when I've been traveling abroad, it is, it's one of those lenses. It's got enough zoom on it, but it also allows me to photograph landscapes, because quite often particularly when we went to Madagascar, um, I was limited to seven kilos of camera equipment, which was a bit of a struggle, and I certainly took a lot more than that. Um, I just didn't let on that my bag weighed about 12 kilos and not seven. Um, but I've actually found that it's, it took a while to get used to, but now I'm used to it. It actually produces um, some very stunning images. It's just the image stabilization that takes a bit of a while to get used to on the camera. Okay, great. Um, got an, another question from uh, M. Hart. Uh, how do you get soft soft focus with the lens? Your lens. Um, sometimes I'll actually pop um, pop a filter on the front, which helps a little bit. Um, with the particular Swan image that does have the soft focus on it, um, for some reason, that particular lens at four hundred was giving soft focus anyway. If I brought it into, if I brought it down to 350, it was pin sharp. Um, but when I took it out to 400, it was actually um, a slightly soft focus. Um, but just bringing, bringing the sharpness of your image down as well can really help to create a softer image. Okay, and when, where was the, um, the picture of the, was it, was it a crocodile? That, that it is a crocodile, yeah. Where, where was that taken? That's actually taken in Madagascar. Okay. It's a Nile crocodile. Fantastic. Um, okay. Um, I think it's the, that's the superb images of the swans uh, in particular. I thought um, next you, you 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 take us through some, looking for something different. You've, you've called it, yeah. The, the final mm -hmm. section of the of the presentation, yeah. 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 So this, this next session, it is about looking for something different. We've all seen hundreds of photos, standard photos of. For example, swans, um, the butterflies, you know, there's, there's a lot of images out there, flowers, dragonflies. But this, I just want to go through looking for different angles, so looking for unusual situations. You hear a lot of people say with wildlife photography, always focus on the nearest eye. But I've actually taken to trying to photograph an animal from behind to almost get an impression of what that animal is looking out on, rather than actually looking directly at the animal. And it's also about looking for different textures in the images. Um, it's particularly true of insects, uh, reptiles as well, and also different expressions. Um, animals have just as many expressions as humans do, and it can be quite challenging to find something a little bit different, but it can be uh, very rewarding when you do. So we're actually going to start with a chameleon. Now, if anyone's struggling um, to find the chameleon, it is actually to the left-hand side of the picture. This is actually taken from slightly behind, and it's sitting in the tree. So you've got the long tail hanging down, and then it's actually, its eye is just above the branch that comes diagonally across the top there. Now, this tree branch is actually hanging out over a river, which is the white that you can actually see um, behind. But again, it's looking for that different angle, something different, something that maybe nobody's seen before. Um, chameleons are famed for their, their curled up tails, and when people photograph them, they want to photograph them with their curled up tails. But quite often, they actually have their tails completely straightened out as well. So it's a bit more of an unusual situation, and it's these kinds of situations that I tend to look for. Now, if I am somewhere, for example, when I was in Madagascar, I will actually also take um, documentary photographs and identification photographs before I start taking more artistic shots so that when I do get home I can actually still ID the animal. It would be a lot harder to actually ID this chameleon from this particular angle. So next up we have another uh, crazy little creature from Madagascar. This is actually a satanic leaf-tailed gecko and 
This is one of the images um, where I'd say looking for textures. You've got lots of textures, lots of colors, and detail in this image. This, can, this gecko is probably at most four or five inches long, so they're not very big at all. Um, but for this one, I wanted to pick out the detail in the eye, and then all the textures in the skin, as well as uh, the branch that it's actually walking along. Now, this is actually a, a brown lemur, and this is what I was referring to when looking for expressions. This was the first visitor that we met when we arrived um, at our campsite, and we literally just got the bag, <coughs> excuse me, got the bags into the room when this little fella popped up onto our veranda, and <coughs> he just he just literally pops hands over the, the branch there and just kind of looked longingly as if we were going to feed him. Although obviously we wouldn't be doing anything like that because I'm a very strong believer in that you don't feed the wild animals and particularly as we'd actually been told don't because if you leave a window open you will actually find them in your bedroom um, ransacking your room looking for any food that you might have. But this is what I mean by capturing expressions. It would have been very easy for me to take a photograph of this lemur just straight on looking directly into its face. But I actually prefer this one slightly to the side and with it looking kind of up and past me. So onto a slightly unusual photo. This is actually a common data dragonfly. They're all over the sunset levels and countryside during the summer months. And with dragonflies and insects, we are used to seeing them you know, seeing their very bright colours and all their textures. But I actually wanted to go for something different and just taking it in black and white and then overexposing it so that the the white bits actually blend into the background. You start to see more detail. You see the black in its eye. You see all the little details of the seg segmentation on its tail as well as the veins in its wing as well. And it is just by using black and white rather than colour and different exposures that you really help to bring out these different textures and the little bits and pieces that make these animals um, capable of living in the areas that they do. So, a little bit different. This is actually a rose, pet uh, a rose, and these are the petals. Now, for this image, it's basically <clears throat> I took this image to to illustrate how you can bring out the textures in a photograph. This rose actually had very velvety pe petals. And that is what I wanted to capture here. Now, it wasn't easy. It's the first time I've really photographed um, roses. But just by getting in close, using a, a higher contrast level, and actually quite a small aperture. I've used F13 on this one um, <clears throat> to bring as much into focus as possible. You can see all the little veins and also the velvety texture on the petals there themselves. And then last up, we have another gecko. Now, this particular gecko is known as a mossy leaf tail gecko. You can probably see from the textures there, it blends in very well to the tree bark. <coughs> Excuse me. And they are incredibly hard to find. During the day, they rest head down on a tree trunk. And you would actually walk past them, mistaking them for a lump on the tree. And that's actually what happened with this one. It was only on closer inspection that we realized it was actually a gecko. Now, I've got lots of the identification photos and the camouflage photos of this particular gecko. But I actually used a flash on this one. But I used it creatively because the light in the rainforest was, was pretty bad. It was actually raining at the time. So there was very, very flat lighting. But I wanted to add some texture, but also just a little bit of lighting just to bring out the eye of this particular gecko. Now, when I do use my flash, I actually have quite a strong diffuser on it. And <coughs> um, that actually just helps to add in some more light, but without completely whiting out um, the subject. And I've actually found that by using the diffuser on my speed light, it actually reduces any disturbance that's caused to the animal because it's, it's not as bright a flash. Okay, so that's actually the last image 
of the presentation. Um, I'll just put a few details up there for you um, if you want to follow me on either Facebook or my blog or even on YouTube. Thanks very much, Victoria. Uh, a tremendous presentation. A couple of uh, uh, similar comments from uh, Michael Larao said his uh, excellent presentation, tremendous content, very well presented. And, and Jerry Walden says probably the best in the series I've seen so far. So thank you. He says thank you for this. Um, appreciate you getting through the webinar and presenting it so professionally and so well with with your your, your bit of cold you've got there. Um, we've just to say that. Um, uh, Victoria will be shortly embarking on a National Geographic sponsored expedition to Romania, is, it, is that right? It is, yeah, it's the Transylvanian Carpathians in Romania. So I, I expect she'll want to feel a little bit fitter for, for that one, uh, but uh, that's, that sounds fantastic and hopefully we might, we might get some, some, something off, uh, from that in, in, in a later stage of the year, but uh, it, was, it was great to be able to catch Victoria before she, she goes away for that that expedition and um, thank you very much for, for joining us today glad you enjoyed the, um, the the webinar just to say that the next um, uh, UK Manfrotto School of Excellence webinar is, 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 is going to be Drew Gardner presents uh, behind the scenes lighting secrets that's um, on Tuesday April the 13th April the 30th sorry uh, 4 to 5 p.m. and the uh, you can check out the details of, of what that's all about and, and book a place as usual on uh, the Manfrotto School of Excellence dot com website. You can also join us uh, on Facebook and, and find out more details about all the webinars and, and what's going on in, in the Manfrotto School of Excellence. So thanks again for joining us and uh, uh, have, enjoy enjoy the rest of the week where you are. Thank you very much. Bye.